Rebecca Chatfield oversees education and outreach for the City of Bellevue Office of Emergency Management. She provides customized education and training for individuals, businesses, faith-based organizations, and neighborhood groups. Rebecca spent many years working for nonprofits and the past five years as an educator in emergency preparedness. She has a PhD in sociology from the UW and has lived in Bellevue for more than 25 years. Rebecca, welcome and thank you for providing this valuable information for us tonight. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Vicki. I really appreciate that. And thank you, Nathan and everybody with the City of Newcastle and the King County Library System for making this presentation possible. So that was a great introduction. I really appreciate it. I've been working at the Office of Emergency Management now for over a year. And I do have to say that for this uh, 2020 COVID times, uh, my attention was split a little bit between emergency response duties and uh, education and outreach, because as you can imagine, we didn't do uh, so much education and outreach there for several months, but I'm very happy that we've been able to pivot and do some virtual offerings like this. And um, I did want to um, go ahead and move the slide forward, Nathan. We'll, we'll get right into some COVID talk here. I did want to just, let's get real a little bit about 2020. It's been, you know, it's it's been a tough year for everyone. Uh, I call, like to call 2020 the year of disruptions. We've had our holiday plans disrupted. Our social gatherings have been limited. We have a travel advisory in Washington state. 2020 is, I don't know, it feels like the longest year. It feels like a decade, right? Imagine what you were doing in January of 2020 and think about that and how so very long ago it feels. and. You know, this year has been tough on our mental health. We've had anxiety and stress and fear and boredom and, you know, all those things weighing on us. And a lot of us have had some pretty significant financial hits to individuals and businesses. So we're creeping up on 10 months into this pandemic. So I just wanted to um, give you some updates, some news you can use about uh, COVID-19 that might be helpful. So next slide. So uh, you can find a lot of really helpful information and fairly up-to-date stuff on coronavirus.wa.gov. You can find data dashboards, information about the current travel advisory, uh, other state restrictions that are going on, testing sites, contact tracing, lots of resources there. So I just wanted to make sure you all had this URL to go look at uh, the data dashboards in particular are what uh, leadership, uh, the Governor Inslee uh, and his crew uh, used to make data-driven decisions about what to do. So uh, right now, of course, we're under a Washington State Travel Advisory with a, a suggested 14-day quarantine when you come back into the state. And this, is, this was just extended today. So uh, now this travel advisory goes through January 4th. And the reason why has to do with those data dashboards. So all the information collected uh, is really pointing to kind of a holistic picture about COVID-19 in our state. And one thing that we know as of just as, as of today, that our hospital uh, intensive care unit beds are 80% full. So there's like a thousand people in the ICU beds. And that's, a, that's a, enough concern. So that is why the travel advisory has been extended, why the statewide restrictions are, are going on. Uh, but a little bit of maybe a little bit more optimistic news, we have uh, $50 million in, in grants for businesses uh, approved and coming uh, down the pike added to 50 million that was available already for small businesses. And the pandemic unemployment assistance program will be extended past December 25th. So even if the feds don't extend it, Washington state will. So there's a little bit of relief financially for folks that way. And next slide. And I do wanna tell you about some really exciting new tool to help what us in our COVID-19 uh, at times right now. This is called WA Notify. It's a smartphone app and you can see the URL there is Department of Health, um, www.doh.wa.gov and you can follow that, um, that string down to the Notify app. What this is, it's a program that uh, is uh, random codes that are generated by our smartphones. They're shared via Bluetooth. And the idea is to create a, uh, information for folks who can use it or not use it 
as they wish. And um, there's no personal data, there's no location data stored or shared. The phones actually collect up codes and then after the fact, if somebody knows if they are COVID positive, they can opt into the system and have the codes that their phone stored and in proximity to other smartphones um, create a system of notifications. So it's all voluntary. It's all, there's no personal data shared. There's no location data shared. It's all through the, the, the random code generation um, through the smartphones. An oversight group uh, was involved to create this that included experts from privacy, security, ethics, community advocacy, and public health to create a, a program where people could have really high quality, important, timely information, but they weren't, um, they weren't required to participate in that. It simply gave them information that they could choose to use um, as they want. And the idea is that people knowing that they were uh, in a close proximity to somebody who later tested positive for COVID could then make those good choices to quarantine and go get tested themselves. This project was rolled out in a soft launch at the University of Washington. And we're really uh, super happy about the fact that it's available in many, many languages as well. So really the idea is privacy and information and everybody uh, can opt into this and choose. It's really easy to put it on your phone. I'm a huge privacy advocate personally, and I read all about this program and I immediately um, put it on my iPhone and um, it's pretty easy to figure out how to do that. So you can read about that if you're interested. Next slide. And the very exciting news is that we have some vaccines on the horizon. So if you watch the news at all, you probably are aware that we have, um, we have a couple, we have some vaccines coming really this month in, in a few weeks. Uh, the uh, FDA emergency authorization of the Pfizer vaccine is coming very soon. We have uh, 250,000 doses coming into the state of Washington. So it's a two shot protocol. So that's actually 125,000 people will be vaccinated um, with these vaccines coming into our state, uh, hopefully before the end of December. And then more vaccines will be rolled out over the early months of 2021 with the goal of having pretty widespread vaccination possibilities for everybody by you know, mid 2021, like summer, maybe late summer. So they're gonna do a prioritized or phased rollout of these vaccines and starting of course with uh, some, some priorities of who's, who's gonna get the vaccinations first. They're gonna start with healthcare workers, and also staff and residents in long-term healthcare facilities, uh, folks that are really at the greatest risk and are exposed to COVID um, more than others. You can see the entire vaccine distribution plan again on the Washington Department of Health. You can see the URL is listed there. And um, just this morning, the first vaccine given in the UK, uh, it happened um, to, um, uh, someone there. So that's that's exciting. Uh, we have uh, a lot of vaccine work happening in many countries around the world. And um, it's just a really, a little bit of an uplifting part of the news for us, but also just to be, just to be clear, we're, you know, it's coming, but we are, we can't let our guard down with COVID. The vaccines are coming, but that's not going to solve the problem right away. We have to get to a point where we have enough of the population vaccinated that um, that uh, that we w can go back to more normal interactions with each other, but it will be some time still. So next slide. So let's talk about our uh, classic emergency preparedness now. Um, being in the middle of a global pandemic makes us forget about things like earthquakes and volcanoes for a little bit. But we need to keep our situational awareness about this. Uh, I did a webinar a few months ago called "Repreparing for Disasters," with the idea that we're we live in we live in a you know kind of a high hazard area in the Pacific Northwest. We've got earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunamis, all sorts of um, interesting things geologically that can happen. And uh, emergency preparedness is really knowing all of your hazards. And and we've been so 
overwhelmed and distracted by COVID news all the time, and me too, you know, frankly, uh, it's hard to sort of switch and and um, think back to some of our you know, our classic uh, hazards that we talk about. And um, so I want to, I just want to say, let's 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 talk about this. Let's talk about emergency preparedness and kind of. Um, think about what kinds of potential disruptions we could have that are not COVID. And we usually start with earthquakes because uh, Washington State has uh, the second highest earthquake risk for big destructive earthquakes. I think Alaska has the most earthquakes. Uh, California obviously is, is the other heavy hitter in this area. We have what's called a Cascadia subduction zone um, known as CSZ. And uh, it runs from the southern part of Canada, like by BC, uh, Canada, all the way down the coast, it's about 800 miles long and it get, hits Northern California down there. It's just off, it's a little bit off the coast of Washington and Oregon. And it's where the uh, North American and the uh, Juan de Fuca tectonic plates are sliding under each other, right? So that's what can um, release all that energy and create a very large earthquake. So disasters are big and they're rare and they affect large regions. So you could imagine a 9.0 type earthquake or even a anything over a seven is gonna be really pretty, um, you know, it's gonna shake us up quite a bit. We also have, of course, the secondary disaster of tsunamis because earthquakes uh, create tsunamis on our coastlines and our Washington coastline is vulnerable to that as well. An earthquake in, you know, Japan would affect us. Uh, we could have a tsunami here for an earthquake across the other side of the world. And of course, those of you who may have lived in this area for longer might remember uh, May of 1980 when Mount St. Helens erupted. So we do have active volcanoes in our area as well. So we have disasters and we have, uh, you know, some pretty interesting features in the Pacific Northwest that part of being prepared, being prepared for emergencies and disasters is really knowing, having situational awareness and knowledge and just some facts about what, what kinds of things should we be thinking about. Okay, next slide. So I want to point out there's, um, there's disasters, the big stuff, but we also have emergencies too. So there's the difference between disasters and emergencies is that in an emergency, you call 911 and a first responder like a firefighter or a police officer or medical personnel will come and, um, will come and help you. In a disaster, you call 911 and, and you can't get through, nobody's answering, the first responders are overwhelmed. So emergencies are kind of smaller, more local, they're personalized, you might, you need like a car crash is an emergency. Um, your road getting flooded out is an emergency a medical emergency for you or your family. That's, that's what we mean by emergencies. So um, understanding what kinds of, of emergencies you might uh, have uh, happen to you is also part of that situational awareness and understanding your hazards and the risks that you have. So we like to say, you know, we don't really know what's gonna happen. Part of being prepared is just sort of understanding kind of the, the, the scene, the specter of all the different kinds of things that might impact our lives and cause, cause disruptions, either short ones or long ones or minor ones or severe ones. And it's all, it's all good to think about. We kind of use, at least traditionally before COVID, we, we use the earthquake as our framing device because that's the one that would uh, affect so many of our systems and um, cause a lot of problems in a lot of ways. Um, so if you're prepared for a big earthquake, if you thought through all those scenarios of what could happen to you in a big earthquake with you know, roads may not be passable, uh, the water might not be working, your house might not be livable, you know, those are the kinds of things we ask people to think through those scenarios. So if something like an emergency happens and you've thought through the earthquake scenario, you're probably gonna be in pretty good shape. So think of all this as um, just kind of a survey of potential disruptions <laughs> in your life. And um, then we'll move on to the, um, to the next slide. And, and again, we're, we're doing all this in the context of COVID. So we wanna keep thinking about and preparing for emergencies and disasters 
and think through some of these really practical things we can do, but we kind of always have to keep COVID as a backdrop in our minds that we're, we need to do all this while staying safe, while having social distancing, washing our hands and wearing masks and all those things. And also just really acknowledging and recognizing that we, we need each other and we're, we're stressed and we're feeling disconnected from each other in some very key way. So anything we can think about that helps us prepare for emergencies and disasters and also helps us connect with other people is going to be just help, help all of us uh, move forward together in a, in a much better way. And you will feel better if you just do something, right? You, you don't have to be overwhelmed by, wow, these disasters sound really huge. What I want you to think about and take away from this conversation today is that if you do even just one really small thing, and I'll have some examples here in a, in a few slides, you will feel better. Just do one thing. It's all good. It all plays in. It's all part of that preparedness journey because it's an iterative process. It's a it's an ongoing circular process of uh, thinking about what might affect you and your family and your loved ones. What kinds of hazards are you um, potentially uh, at risk of experiencing? What kinds of disruptions might you experience? And just doing even a even a few things. One thing is going to be better than nothing, and it will give you uh, something to hold on to, something to do. And if you can figure out how to do that thing while you're connecting with the people around you, that's just a, that's just a winner. Okay, next slide. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what are those proactive steps that you can do uh, to be prepared for these things. Um, so we'd like to say make a plan, right? And uh, obviously your whatever plan you make is not gonna work, right? You're gonna have to make a bunch of plans and keep making your plans and things are gonna happen that don't go to plan, right? That's that's okay, but it is important to just go ahead and and make a plan and that will help you, that will help you focus. It will help you crystallize all the pieces that you wanna put together and all the things that you're that you're worried about, that you're thinking about, that you care about. So you wanna make a plan, not in the middle of an disaster, not while you're stressed out, not while you're, you know, things are going very badly wrong and um, the lights are out or whatever. You don't wanna, you don't wanna make a plan then. You wanna make a plan when, you know, it's, it's pretty quiet, when you're feeling good and you have some resources available and, um, you know, Amazon Prime is, probably delivering, you know, to your door right now. So um, we call that blue sky days. And it's hard to think of blue, blue sky days while, you know, COVID's happening. But this really is kind of a, it's a good time. Our, our critical infrastructure is intact. We have the supply chain is happening. We have stuff in the grocery stores. You can order things online. Our internet is up, right? This is kind of, this is a good time to make a plan. So to make a plan, you just, it's pretty simple, really. You just think about a few key things. One is, who do you love? Who who do you love? Who do you care about? Who's in your family? Who's in your network? Uh, who would you want to communicate with if a disruption was happening, either to you or to them? Who would you want to have that um, communication with? Um, and um, how would you do that? So that's part of your plan. You want to think about your location. Now, right now, our location is probably our bed, the kitchen, our couch, our desk, <laughs> then the kitchen again, and then maybe the couch. And then, you know, so that's kind of our, our map that we do. You might not be trolling all around Bellevue or Newcastle or driving, uh, you know, between Washington and Idaho right now. You probably shouldn't be doing those things. Uh, so the actual location where people are spending a lot of their time might be quite different. So, but I do want you to think about the map of where you're spending your time. And so where are you most likely to be if a disruption happened? And so just literally take a physical map and um, in some other, you know, earlier times we might've put pins in where like, here's where I live, here's where my kid's school is, or here's my workplace, or my elderly parent lives here. And just really thinking about the roads and where you would need to go and the information about how would you physically get from one place to another to get to those people that you love, right? So you might want to physically get to them. You might want to communicate with them. This is all part of making a plan. So think about who you love. Think about who you want to communicate and how. 
and where you might physically need to go because that's and pull out your maps and think about that. And then you'll make a customized checklist of these things for what matters to you and your family. So um, just a, a couple comments here about the communication part. So your uh, um, emergency communications plan is uh, really, it's pretty, it can be pretty simple. You want to identify somebody who's out of the area, who's not gonna be in your zone of disruption. So um, I always suggest that people pick somebody outside of our kind of active earthquake zone. So think East, you know, Eastern Washington, Idaho, East, keep going. Um, if you have family or connections who are outside of the area where a, a, a bigger earthquake would affect along the West Coast, someone who lives in that area might be a really good person to pick as your out of area contact. And then what you wanna do is uh, work with all the people that you love and practice texting that person, not calling them because calling voice calls take a lot of bandwidth, but texts are quicker and easier and a lot more can get through and they can also be queued up. So if it doesn't go through right away, it might get through later. So pick that person who's out of the area. It could even be somebody international, right? You, that, that would work too. If you have family in another country, that could be a really good strategy for you. And um, think about creating that person as a point of contact for all the people that might be in the affected zone and, and talk it through and maybe use this holiday season to practice texting your out of area contact. And that person becomes kind of the, the hub of communication for all the people that you love. And everybody would text that one person and then that one person would be um, the, you know, the central contact point for everybody. Cause you might not be able to text each other within the earthquake area. So that, that's how you manage your out of area contacts. So all of these things about making a plan are very personalized, right? This, you think about who you love, think about who you wanna communicate with, think about where they live, where you live, what the routes are, what kinds of customized things you need to think about for you. And, and it takes some time to think it through and it can be really, um, really uplifting conversations to have. I've had many, many great conversations with extended family about these matters and it can be really a great bonding experience to do that. So I would encourage you to weave this into our virtual separated <laughs> holiday season and maybe you can, um, leverage some of this into an interesting set of conversations with the people that you love. Okay, next slide. So um, I often get asked lots of very detailed questions about the stuff, right? People want to go right to what kind of water filter should I buy? And, you know, what do you have in your kit? And they're always very interested when I show up and I unpack my bag and I say, here's the stuff in my kit. And they say, oh, you must have a really good kit because you know what you're doing. And yeah, I do. But it's also really specific to me and my family. So your kit's going to look really different. But I did want to give you some basic categories of things that you might want to have in your kit. So uh, you can see we've got water and filters, shelter, flashlights, radio, first aid, toiletries, medications, food. So I do want to point out foods at the bottom of the list. And that's if you have ever uh, heard of the rule of threes, this is something to keep in mind. You can go three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without food. Now, nobody wants to go three weeks without food, and we probably wouldn't have to do that most of the time. But the people want to go right to the food and how much food should I store and should I buy this kind of peanut butter or that kind of peanut butter. And actually, I'd say think more about water first because that's that's the hard thing to store. You gotta um, you gotta have a lot of water actually. You know, if, if the water lines are disrupted and you your faucet's not working and there's no water coming out in the normal way, uh, you have to plan for a gallon per person per day. A gallon of water per person per day. That is, you know, that's a fair bit of water, depending on the size of your family. If you want to have a couple weeks or even a couple months of supplies available close by to you, that can get, that can be, be challenging, really. Water is very heavy. Don't think you're going to hike out with two weeks of water on your back, because each gallon of water is eight pounds. So that's just a lot of weight. So water is one of those things. If you're storing it, 
you have to think about your kind of uh, living situation. You, it might not be feasible for you to store a lot of water on site. So I would suggest that you look into some filters. Um, if you've ever done any hiking or camping, if you've ever walked around REI and looked at their camping stuff, there's lots of really good uh, water filters out there that, that you can take um, on those outdoor activities that would work really well in this situation as well. So there's a lot of like ultra light camping gear you can buy that can be great. If you wanna create a kit that you can put on your back and walk around with, think about uh, long distance hiking, camping kind of situations for that. But of course, you know, that's only one kind of kit that you'd have is something that you'd have to actually carry around. So let's go to the next slide. And I wanna talk about, there's not just that one kit. You can't just go on Amazon and buy one kit and say, okay, I'm prepared now. Because that one kit that you buy that's already pre-made, it's probably not gonna be perfect for you and your family. And I want you to start thinking instead about kit, lots of kits. There's kits are just collections of stuff and they're in different places. And each kit is has different things in it. So we have half a dozen different kinds of kits in my house. And, and so I'm just gonna talk through some of the pictures on the slide here. And we'll start with the trunk there, the upper, the one at the top. That's just a bin full of stuff. And that's the kind of thing that you would put a bunch of stuff in and then you'd store that in your garage or in a closet somewhere. Um, and that can be first aid supplies and things you might just wanna have in your house. And then let's move over. Look at that big picture in the middle of the slide. You've got the, that's the, the, the family that has really figured out their long-term preparedness stuff. You've got cans of food and you have those big blue water barrels there. Those are water barrels, those um, round ones and holding lots and lots of water. I think those are 50 gallon barrels there. So that would be sort of the pinnacle of you've, you've created a, a space in your basement, you've built some shelves, you've got your food and your water stored there in a really uh, systematized way. So now going over one, let's look at that picture in the upper right corner. That is your bedside earthquake kit. So that's another kind of kit. And every single one of you tonight, if you haven't already done this, this is the, a big takeaway for you. This is a simple, easy thing you can do. This is one really positive thing you can do tonight. You basically, uh, you take a pair of sturdy shoes that um, fit you well, that may be a second pair of shoes or a spare set of shoes and a flashlight. That's it, that's the basics of that kit. You can add in gloves and uh, socks and other things in there. But what you're doing is you're putting your shoes and your flashlight in a little tote bag, and then I want you to tie it to the leg of your bed. So shoes and a flashlight in a little bag, and then somehow attach it to the leg of your bed. So this is your earthquake kit. So if the earthquake hits at three in the morning, you just lay in bed, wait for the earthquake to finish, then what, what will have happened if it's a big enough earthquake? The windows will be broken. There will be shattered glass all over the floor. And if you jumped out of your bed and stepped on that broken glass, then boom, now you've got a problem, right? You've got an issue you need to take care of. So what I would want you to do is have your, your shoes and your flashlight and you reach under your bed and because it was tied to the leg, it didn't bounce across the floor during the shaking. And before you get out of bed, you put on your shoes and you turn on your flashlight because it's gonna be dark. So there you go, that's your kit. That's your homework for tonight is to make your earthquake kit and you can put other things in there if you want to. I suggest chocolate for stress relief, but you know, that's really up to you. Uh, but definitely shoes and a flashlight. And then the picture down below that, that's just simply a car with, you can see how much stuff you can get in your trunk. If you're going on a long trip, I'd suggest you have a long distance car kit with stuff in it like flares and extra water and things like that. And then over uh, back doing in a clockwise progression here, that's a rolling backpack there, that, that picture um, there in the middle. And that's just meant to remind you that backpacks are really heavy. And especially if you need to hike out or go anywhere and carry stuff with you, a rolling backpack is gonna be a much more effective way for you to take a lot of stuff that's heavy. You don't really wanna be 
walking around with a heavy backpack if you can avoid it. So get yourself a rolling suitcase and that can also be a kit that's really easy to grab and walk out with it or throw it in your car. And then the last picture, um, Paul, I think you're on the call here too. So I wanna say this is my friend Paul's car. It's a Jeep and his Jeep is a kit because he can use it. He has a winch on it. It's all decked out with stuff. He goes car camping. He uh, basically jumps into his kit and he drives around and he can live in very rough conditions um, inside of his kit, which is also his Jeep. So um, he's uh, often uh, adjusting things on it and trying things out as he's camping. So your car could be your kit as well. Okay, well, next slide. So I don't want you to get too overfaced. <laughs> Oh, I see you just said something in the chat, Paul. Okay, we'll look at that. Uh, so you're, you can um, do this in a really slow way. You can do this very much on the cheap. Your kit does not have to be filled with the top of the line things that you buy online. You probably have a lot of things in your house already. Um, if you've done any camping at all, you, you might have some very useful things that would go in your kits. Uh, you can have some duplicate items. You can find things at thrift stores. Um, you know, this is, doesn't have to be rocket science uh, about how to do this. Uh, Red Cross gives you a, um, a, like a week by week list here. That's what this is a picture of is the Red Cross um, list of how you kind of systematically over time build up your pantries and, and buy supplies and things like that. And I do wanna say that um, it's important to think about how much space you have in your house. If you, have a 3,000 square foot, you know, house with a basement and a garage and an attic and closets everywhere. That's a really different scenario than if you're in downtown Bellevue and you live in a studio apartment and you've got 600 square feet and one closet and you're, you know, you have your laptop and your toothbrush and that's pretty much all you got. So you're not going to have a whole lot of space if you're, you know, living in a, in a more confined place and it might not make sense for you to, to buy a lot of stuff. So think about how much space you have. And also it's important to try to store stuff in a cool, dry place if you can possibly do that too. That just helps preserve all those food items and things. All right, let's go to the next slide. Another idea is, and this is getting back to the idea of how do you connect with people in this time of COVID and we wanna do some emergency preparedness. So there are some things you can imagine might be really helpful in a disruption, in an emergency or a disaster that would be really helpful to have access to, but you don't necessarily wanna buy a crowbar and a ladder if you're one of those people living in the studio apartments. So there's lots of opportunities for kind of collective action here, getting to know your neighbors, um, talking about what might make sense for your neighborhood or for your building and figuring out, you know, you can do an inventory of your neighborhood, of your neighbors, and talk about the kinds of things that people have. You might be surprised, like you only need one guy with a chainsaw to take care of the trees that, that fall down over your street, right? You don't, you don't need 12 chainsaws, you just maybe need one, and somebody that knows how to use a chainsaw safely, right? So, uh, so this is an idea for you to try, is think about building your kits at a neighborhood level, and now the hurdle here is going to be um, meeting your neighbors, getting to those conversations, and um, you might leverage existing HOAs. You might look at um, social clubs that exist around your neighborhood. Using Nextdoor is can be a really good tool. That's an online organizing, you know, neighborhood level uh, online tool. You can try uh, this kind of organizing with uh, your community groups with faith-based organizations, other, other groups that might be um, logical ways to do this kind of collective uh, uh, you know, inventory and supplies. And it, it doesn't have to be in your physical neighborhood, but I, it really helps because most of the time with these emergencies and, and disasters, you do wanna be able to reach out to the people that live close to you. So having some knowledge of who lives around you and what they have, um, could be could be a really helpful um, helpful thing to do. Okay, next slide. And in a similar vein, as you're getting to know your neighbors and talking about preparedness at a neighborhood level, um, 
it's really great to figure out who's got what skills, right? So you've got all the kind of hands-on skills on the left of this, the slide here, that's kind of the doing stuff, people that know how to do first aid, maybe ham radio operators in the group, uh, folks with construction or wiring or plumbing uh, skills can be really helpful if things have been damaged. Firefighters, obviously there's always risk of fires in every situation, but you also have on the right, you have kind of softer skills or social skills that are just as important in a uh, disaster. So childcare, teaching and organizing, counseling, people that speak multiple languages, anybody that's really good at organizing groups, those are also important skills to have. And part of your getting to know your neighbors should involve getting to know them and what kinds of skills they bring as well. Because everybody's bringing something to the table and it's really great to, um, to figure that out. Okay, next slide. So here's the opportunities to learn and practice. There's several programs that already exist and, and activities you can do that can get you along this uh, path of learning how to have useful life-saving skills, skills that are really helpful in disaster. So there's a program called Map Your Neighborhood that's been around for a really long time. I've got the brochure somewhere here. You can get, you can get that information from the Washington State, they have a whole set of brochures like this that walk you through the program. Um, it's a way of getting to know your neighbors. It's a structured way to get to your, know your neighbors, to find out the equipment and the skills that they have. And um, it's, it's a very social thing and it's very much aimed at in-person stuff. So it's a little bit tricky right now, but the, the concepts around it are, are great. And um, another, Another idea is that you can just practice skills. You don't necessarily have to do everything with your neighbors. So every year there is something called the Great Shakeout. We just had it here in October where um, we do, it's, it's a practice, it's not a real earthquake. We can't time them like that. It'd be nice if we could schedule our earthquakes, but of course we can't. So this is a scheduled drill just to practice the physical things you need to do with your body during an earthquake. So every year, um, you know, oh gosh, millions of people sign up for this. And at a particular time on a particular day, it's the third Thursday in October, you can see what they did with the date. It's October 15th at 10.15. So the date is 10.15, the time is 10.15. Uh, everybody takes um, one or two minutes and they pretend there's an earthquake and they do what you should do in an earthquake, which is get under something heavy so drop, cover, and hold on. So you can see the picture there of the little person crawling on the floor and getting under the table. So get under a table or a desk and cover your head and hold on. And the idea with drills, and this applies to any kind of training or drill you might do, is that in times of um, stress or you know in an emergency, we don't necessarily have our best thinking caps on. And so the more that you have physically practiced how to do um, the movements that might help protect you and get you to safety, the more you physically practice them, the more likely you're going to do them right. When um, an emergency happens and your brain might, you might kind of freeze a little bit mentally, but your body will know how, you'll have kind of that automatic physical response built in. So it's really important to physically practice like with your body, with your hands, think about the scenario and just try it and practice it. So the shakeout drill is just meant to remind us every year that we need to actually like do this. We need to do stuff that, um, so that when something happens unexpected, uh, unexpectedly, we kind of kick into, into action and we don't have to mentally process it in, in a full way. We just sort of know what to do and uh, we react really quickly and it can be a, a very big and important safety thing. So the third, um, the third, uh, training opportunity or um, disaster skills uh, training opportunity I'd, I'd ask you to think about or look into is the Community Emergency Response Team or CERT. So CERT is very well established around in the East Side. We have a, what's called CERT East Side Coalition, which is 10 cities um, all around the East Side area who all have active CERT programs. And um, this is a kind of training that uh, goes through some disaster medical, some search and rescue, some um, fire suppression, and um, aimed at 
uh, teaching every everyone, teaching anybody uh, skills that would be useful and important in a disaster. Because if something like a big earthquake happens, the fire department and the police department, they're not gonna be like at your door right away. <laughs> they might not be at your door for kind of a long time. So who's gonna be the first responders in a situation like that? It's gonna be the people around you. It's gonna be your neighbors. So the more people that have learned these life-saving skills through CERT, the more likely it is we're gonna be able to just help each other in the moment um, if something happens and the first responders are overwhelmed. So you can find CERT training around. Again, it's tricky. Right now, a lot of this training is very hands-on and in-person. There are some online resources. You can take some CERT class. Uh, training materials are available online as well with the idea that as 2021 rolls along and we get back a little bit towards our, uh, our usual activities in person, we can pick up some of those in-person skills training like CERT. You can also go look at um, trainings and skills, skills trainings and other classes available for you uh, in your area. Um, right now, of course, things being virtual means we have a much uh, wider uh, sphere to choose from for these trainings. But I'd, uh, I'd suggest you check out the Red Cross. They have a lot of a great, um, of course, the Red Cross has been around for 150 years and they have millions of volunteers all across the world. So they're really a wonderful organization. They have first aid and CPR training and babysitter training and lifeguard training and stuff like that. And really um, useful, um, useful and really well done programs through Red Cross. You can also check out local hospitals as well, that there's often free trainings um, offered through the hospitals that can be really helpful. And then last but not least, sometimes your local uh, jurisdiction, your emergency management department might have something. You can look at the, the city, the state, or the county level for emergency management type training. Um, and you kind of have to hunt around for that because it's a little bit hit and miss. But there's lots of places to look around to find um, useful skills. And I just want to um, remind you that it doesn't matter. You don't have to be overwhelmed by this. You can pick one thing and just do one thing. And anything you do is good. It's all part of the process of being a little bit more informed and a little bit more aware and a little bit more skilled about something. And it, it's all good. So next slide. And that's it. That's what I had to tell you today. I wanna to thank you very much. Uh, let me see, I'm pretty close to the time. I went a little bit over. So I'm happy to, um, to entertain some questions. And with that, I'll give it back to Vicki. That was incredible, Rebecca. Thank you. What a great presentation. Um, I do invite you all to type your questions in chat. We'll have an opportunity a little um, later We've got chat questions for people to unmute themselves if typing is an issue for you. But I do have uh, a couple questions here. Um, this was going back to your original COVID uh, update that you gave us at the beginning. And um, folks in the audience are really helpful. People were chiming in in chat. Thank you all so much. Um, but just to clarify, uh, somebody asked when you talked about the vaccines coming in, um, off the top of your head, do you know who that's going to be uh, targeted for? Is it going to be people in retirement homes or the long-term care facilities? Yes, healthcare workers and folks, staff and residents of long-term healthcare facilities. So, you know, the, that population is going to be first. So that's phase 1A is what they're calling it. And you can look at the, the vaccine distribution plan is posted um, on the URL from the slide. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but that is available for you to go read. And you can also um, keep an eye on uh, the coronavirus.wa.gov and also Governor Inslee's um, posted materials as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, regarding phones, so during an emergency, uh, you recommend texting, um, and we had a question, uh, do you have any opinion about landline versus uh, cell phones? Are landlines still, uh, can they get through where cell phones can't? Yeah, so landlines are gonna, they're gonna work when a lot of other things don't work. So if you have a landline, keep your landline, that's great. 
um, the, when the power goes out, your landline will still work. So um, that's helpful. It's just most people have given up their landline. So we kind of drop that out of our presentations in general. But I'd say if you still have one and you're willing to keep, keep it going, I would keep it going. Um, so yeah, it's a different kind of technology and you're not going to you're not going to be impacted by if the cell powers go down your landline won't be impacted by that so it's another form of resilience to have another method of communication so i would say if you still have one yep keep it around not a it's not a bad idea and somebody had typed in chat that the landline will only work in a power outage only if it's a true landline that's copper wire and um, more yeah. and more these days uh yeah. they're getting rid of copper wire so yeah that that's that could be true i don't know the those details specifically but that sure sounds right <laughs> yeah. yeah um lots of great comments and thanks here let's see somebody wrote in oh hi carol sometimes the place to escape can be our backyards can you speak to that rebecca Wow, yeah, you know, this is a tough time. We are, we're used to being able to just motor around and go places and um, anything you can do to, you know, right now, especially, right, right now as COVID cases are surging, anything you can do that keeps your activities close to home is, it's, it's not gonna last forever, people. It's really, it's gonna, it's gonna get better. 2021 is gonna get gradually, our options are going to open up as time goes on. So, um, yeah, you know, refocusing your activities to to your house, keeping things really local, keeping them, you know, trying to just have fun in your backyard. That's all good, and um, I applaud that sentiment. Excellent. And somebody mentioned that a good water storage can be someone's. Um, water tank home water tank in the garage would be a resource for water and uh, somebody mentioned that they didn't have one of those they had one of the instant water heaters so do you recommend maybe just buying a rain barrel and filling that up with water so there's a couple ways you can deal with water the easiest probably is go to costco and buy a flat of bottled water and that's going to be good for six months i wouldn't store it for longer than that because the quality of the water, water doesn't go bad. It doesn't like age out or anything, but it can get contaminated by the container. And so the mm -hmm. traditional blue colored water containers, blue is the standard color for water, just like um, yellow is for diesel and red is for gasoline in the container, right? So if you see a blue, blue container, that's um, to signal water. And um, so the, your easiest bet is to buy just bottled water that's fine. The next, the next kind of leap up from that would be to buy something called a water brick, or there's a couple different things like that that are, um, you know, smaller. They're bigger than a water bottle, but they're um, smaller than a rain barrel, and you can store water in, you know, five gallon increments like that. And those can you can buy things that stack and um, fit nicely in a closet. What you want to do, though, is pay attention to the kind of, it's mostly plastic. You can store water in ceramic and glass and all sorts of things, but typically people are storing water in plastic, and you want to make sure that that plastic is, is, is a high-quality plastic that doesn't leach into the water. So um, that's, uh, yeah, and you can go all the way up to a bigger storage, like the, the big blue barrels and things like that. The trick with that, though, is you have to make sure as you're putting the water into the container that the container is sterilized. So no matter what it is, that's why if you buy sealed bottle, bottles from Costco, it's sealed. You don't have to sterilize it, right? It's sealed up. But if you're going to put water into a container, you need to make sure that you have um, bleached it out properly and that when you seal it, you seal it tightly. So you don't want contaminants to be inside of the container or to get into your water bottle after you've put the water in because that then when you open it up you know you've got bad water and um, you don't want to set yourself up for that so it takes a little bit of care and time and the right supplies to make sure that you have really sanitized your water container if you're going to use anything but kind of a commercially sealed water bottle 
And um, I just, I just really, most of the time for most people, it's easiest to buy flats of water and swap them out um, every six months. Uh, is it safe to store water in metal food containers? I would not store water that way, only because you can't bleach metal. The usual way we disinfect our containers is with bleach. If you boiled the metal containers and had a way to seal it, maybe, but again, it's all about um, making sure that the water that you put in not only is um, you know uncontaminated water to start with, but that your container is um, pristine as you put the water in and you have a way to seal it. So for example, uh, I knew of a situation in which somebody stored a water in their garage and they'd had a, a gas spill on the concrete and they had the water sitting straight on the concrete um, floor and the gas actually seeped through the concrete up through into the water container. So um, that's a little bit of a, a tricky one <laughs> to do, but um, uh, yeah. Oh, Nathan's raising his hand. I'm not sure what that means. So just so you know, uh, if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, they have the big dark blue water cooler containers that are sealed. Mm -hmm. And those last for years and you can store those in your garage and they provide a lot of water. Yeah, it's really important with water, especially to store it in as dark and cool of a place as you can because the bacteria and things, any little bit that gets in there, you want to uh, make sure you um, inhibit the growth of anything by keeping it cool and dark. So that could be your garage, could be your basement, probably not your attic, could be a closet. You know, just think about your space and where it's going to work the best for that. But just think cool and dry, cool and dry, dark. Yeah. Thanks, Nathan. Um, all right, I think we've run out of our chat questions. If anybody has um, issues with typing in chat and want to ask a question now, I invite you to unmute yourself or raise your hand. And I'll give you a, a minute to do that. And while I'm doing that, we are wrapping up tonight. I want to thank everyone for coming this evening. Uh, it was a fantastic fantastic program and i loved the fact that you encourage people not to get overwhelmed because it's pretty easy to get overwhelmed it's like oh my god how do i even start so it's nice to have that permission to just begin to make a plan and start making those little moves towards it and uh, we did have folks asking for the slides rebecca it's okay if i share slides in my resource email yeah, follow-up so I'll be sharing the slides, folks, uh, some good web link resources. Um, we are recording this. That's going to be a post for, to view for those of you who joined us late or were unable to attend. I want to thank the City of Newcastle for putting this together, uh, particularly their Community Activities Commission that were the um, big pushers behind getting this out to the Newcastle community and uh, via Zoom to our greater King County community. So I want to thank all of you who um, tuned in from all across King County. I hope you found this useful and got some good tips. And um, I think that wraps it up, folks. So I want to thank you all again for attending. Oh, John, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh I have a couple of fire extinguishers in my garage that have been there for a number of years. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether they're good, bad, or what. Where should I take those? To the local fire station to get so them checked John, out? John, what you can do, if there's a gauge on it that has the green or the red, just look and if, it's, if they're too old and they don't have that little indicator, um, then it probably is too old. <laughs> you can you can go in your backyard and um, and spray them out into the bushes and then put them in the garbage. That's what the fire department wants you to do with old fire extinguishers. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. And anybody else that would like to unmute to ask a question? I had one more question. I don't know whether this fits into the uh, scope of this meeting, but uh, how important is it to have uh, carbon monoxide gauges in your home? Oh yeah, for sure. That's a standard now. You can't buy a new house that doesn't have that in there. You can't rent a house. You should you should have 
all sorts of sensors like that. You can buy the combination smoke alarm and carbon monoxide indicator, but yeah, definitely put one on each floor and outside of each bedroom. Hmm. And they go, they, they last about 10 years and then they, they fail, they're done. So they're, they're meant to be about a 10 year thing. So you can buy them at Costco or a lot of places and you can buy them in a two pack. And uh, yeah, I would suggest you do that. You can also check with your local fire department and ask them for help. They have lots of resources to help people with any kind of detectors like that. And they would be happy to talk to you about that. Thank you. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I love this comment, Rebecca. Rebecca made it seem less stressful to gather the emergency items together. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, Rebecca, and going. Oh, yeah. Going back to um, the conversation about water, Rebecca, would you say that if we've had water um, in a sealed plastic container? in as cool a place as we could um, have it, but it's been, you know, years or whatever, mm -hmm. when we finally have to uh, use it, would you recommend that we treat it anyway to be safe or if it's sealed, is it okay? Um, it, if it's a plastic container over time, the plastic will break down and get into the water. So I would suggest mm -hmm. if it's over a couple of years old, use it to water your plants Yeah. Okay. Or, or, you know, something like that to rinse right. off your pet <laughs> or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't drink it if it's been that long. Okay. Um, just because it's all about the container. Yes. Like, contaminating the water. The water itself, you know, can be in the container of the middle of the earth for millions of years and it's fine. But that's yeah. a ceramic container, <laughs> a clay mm -hmm. container, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And then if, if, if we do have water, Mm -hmm. um, that's not necessarily super fresh and there's an earthquake and mm -hmm. the faucets aren't working. Mm -hmm. Drink it. Would you recommend that yeah, we filter that water or do, oh, we, well, do we treat it? Uh, if, if it's, if it's, if it was, um, purified when it was, went in, I wouldn't, you don't need to repurify it okay. because okay. what you're worried about is that plastic contamination, which I see. Know, it's not, that's not, not going to, you're not going to fix it. Yes, uh, okay. I would say if you're if you're finding these sources of water and you're not too sure about them, mm -hmm. you want to do a two step process, which is filter with a coffee filter, uh, like a unbleached coffee filter, and then either boil or use bleach. Mm -hmm. And there's um, it's eight drops per gallon of water, I think, is the right ratio. So basically, think of two steps, which is filter and then purify. And bleach. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Great. And you can awesome. look up online the 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 rules for that, but. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, all right, folks, so we have come up on the end of the program. Uh, we invite you to, uh, I'll include the email for um, OEM at Bellevue, uh, uh, who Rebecca works for. So if you have further questions, you can reach out to them and they can get your questions answered. I'll have a lot of resources um, in my follow up mail. For those of you not in Newcastle, if you're tuning in from a different city, most all cities have some type of Office of Emergency Management. So uh, you can look them up, uh, reach out to them as well. I posted the link to the CERT Eastside in chat and I'll include that in my follow-up email. Great, great organization to get um, involved with. Uh, amazing education. And really the more citizens that we have on the ground that have this information in an emergency or disaster, we are all gonna be better for it. So if you have the time and energy, I highly suggest um, reaching out and getting involved in CERT. Um, all right, so uh, I want to bid you all a good night. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Rebecca and the city of Newcastle and the CAC for providing this program. Uh, City of Newcastle folks, we are going to be sending out a survey. The CAC wants to recruit you into uh, City of Newcastle's emergency management uh, program. So look for that survey and fill it out and they will be in touch. All right, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye.